Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Minecraft Disney World Q&A. This is the series in which uh, you guys all ask me questions, all manner of Disney-related, whether it's the films, the animations, the parks, the video games, and I try to give you answers to the best of my abilities. Sometimes that answer might be I don't know, but, you know, I try my best. Um, this week, we're here on MC Magic, the one-to-one -one scale recreation of Walt Disney World, as we are every week. And uh, we're at the Animal Kingdom, and I'm going to wander around a bit, uh, explore the parks, and answer your questions. So, that said, let's uh, go ahead and jump right in. This week, our first question comes from Bella Smith, who asks, uh, You say how a lot of new rides are based off of movies, instead of trying to make uh, original storylines. Why do you think this is? Do you think it's because it's easier, or because they think it will become more popular than an original idea? Thanks. Uh, great question. So, yes, I've mentioned many times that I feel like Disney relies on previously established IP a lot when it comes to making rides, at least recently. And uh, I think there's a very simple answer to as to why that is, and that's because it it creates what uh, business people like to use. The business word they like to use is synergy or cross promotion. And it's the idea that one thing is going to promote another and they're going to promote each other. And as a result, both things are going to sell better. Um, for instance, I'm trying to think of a good example. If um, they made a frozen ride tomorrow, they open up a frozen ride. Uh, park attendance will probably go way up. And part of that is... No, I shouldn't even say part of that. The reason for that is because people saw the movie Frozen and they love the movie Frozen. And so it's something they know, it's something they know they enjoy, and it's something that they'd want to experience. Now that can, that's one way it could work out, right? It could be um, something where they're trying to promote two new things at the same time. For instance, they renamed Countdown to Extinction to Dinosaur to try and cross promote the movie Dinosaur when it was coming out. And at that point, Countdown to Extinction was relatively new. Uh, and the idea is if you go to the ride, you would be um, made aware of the film. And if you watch the film, you might be made aware of the ride just through the conversation or some research and the idea is they sort of carry themselves and and lift each other up and as a result you've got two better products uh as for do i think it's easier i actually don't i think in some cases it might actually be more difficult um especially when you look at something like marvel or star wars which has such a strict established universe now if you're making a ride like a star wars ride they have to make sure that it sort of fits within the mythos of star wars or else it'll just seem off and it'll cheapen the the property so in that sense it could be actually more limiting and thus more difficult to make a ride based on something that's already a movie uh but you know of course the reason they do it is because there's this hypothetical payoff that it's going to do better um but, you know, that doesn't always work. Sometimes it does work. And, you know, I've, I've spoken my mind on that, that topic many times. But uh, that was a great question. Next up. Oh, here we have the, the Dino Land. We have our Roller Coaster Tycoon 3 is epic. I just put together a username. Um, hey, Rob, I'm the type who likes to think of what would fit into the Disney parks, and I would like a second opinion on this. We have all seen DCA's new 1940s to 1960s era theming. What do you think about a car stunt show like Lights, Motor, Action going into DCA, but within the theme of the Mafia films? Thanks, and have a great week. That is a cool idea. Now, I am biased. I like the 40s and the 50s as a sort of stylistic, like, uh... Uh, decade so you know just the idea of you know all these 1950s cars doing car stunts would be really cool I'd say because of the way those cars were built it's not gonna be much of a stunt spectacular so I don't know about it like replacing uh, lights motors actions as much as having some sort of you know maybe something like Indiana Jones more than lights motor actions less with the car stunts but more of a show a stunt show in general and having it like 50s themed yeah now, here's, the way, here's what I do, and, and I just spoke my mind about tie-ins, so I realize I'm being a little hypocritical here, but how about instead of Mafia Base, if you want to still do the 40s and the 50s and stay within the realm of Disney, what about a Rocketeer stunt show? Um, sure, the Rocketeer is not as culturally relevant as it used to be. <laughs> That's sort of the movies, I think, like 20 years old now. Um... But, you know, hey, that's a good tie-in to reboot the movie, right? Just reboot it. Uh, please reboot it, Disney. It's like one of my favorite movies. 
I think that would be cool. And I'd like to see that. I think, you know, um, there's there's a, there's a nice layer of class and, and aesthetic to the 1950s. And of course, I think a big part of that is because I didn't grow up in the 50s and every uh, decade is going to have like its dark, you know, parts and it's going to have its, you know, parts of it that aren't that great. But, you know, from a purely aesthetic standpoint of just like the cars and the way people dressed, I thought it was really cool. Uh, our next question comes from B. Fish Alex Imagineering, who asks, which do you think is more important to create a good attraction, the story or the technology? I think that some attractions favor one over the other, like Mission Space, and that the reason that the Haunted Mansion is such a beloved attraction is due to its balance between the two. Also, you're saying my username correctly, thanks to Have a Magic Day. Awesome. Uh, I hope I've said it correctly again the second time. <clears throat> That's a great question, and I think you actually answered the question within your own question, which is a great attraction needs to have both, and it needs to have a good balance between the two. I don't think one takes precedence over the other, um, and I would agree that some, like, mission space favor one over the other, and that those that are, like, more timeless um, are balancing both really well so i think you know that's in short the, that is the answer is that it needs to have both it's very much like a movie in those regards or a video game in those regards in that there isn't one aspect you know a lot of people like to say video games oh it's all about the gameplay it's all about the gameplay gameplay is important that's there's no doubt about that but to say that as if everything else isn't is actually really wrong and you need to have all these pistons firing off at the right moment in order to come together and be something great. Same thing works for film, you know? You need good actors, a good performance, good dialogue, a good plot, good filmmaking. All of this comes together and that's how you get a great film. That doesn't mean that without any one of them, you can't have a good movie, but it's gonna suffer for it. And so, ideally you want all of them to be, you know, as good as they can possibly be. And I honestly, even though there are rides in Disney that I'm not a big fan of, you know, like Mission Space, I never think that Disney is preferring one over the other. I do think Mission Space favors tech over the other, but I think it's important to to point out the difference between how it turned out and how they went into it. I think the Imagineers are super talented, and whenever they go into creating an attraction, they put their whole you know effort into every element of it. And I think the same goes for most filmmakers and people who work on video games. Nobody ever wants to make a bad ride or a bad movie or a bad video game. They're always trying their best. It's just sometimes that doesn't it doesn't turn out the way they want it to. And so in those cases I think that's just what's happening is it's you know for one reason or another something didn't you know uh, pan out the way they wanted and and it's a shame but it happens and that's sort of what happens in any creative field. Uh, our next question is a great one, and actually, let's warp over to the Hollywood Studios because it's relevant. So our next question comes from David Willis, and this actually starts with a little correction. So according to Jim Corcus, he says, Echo Lake was named that because of the echoes coming off of it during construction. Apparently, a few construction workers were not too happy with one, one of the foremen, and they're saying some not-so-nice things about him while he was on the other side. He had heard them saying this through the echo, and they got into a little hot water. Uh, I wonder if that's true or not. Like, the fact that you're attributing it to Jim Corcus has me believe it is true because he's a really great Disney historian. But that sounds so weird for them to keep the whole name of this area based on something like that. I almost wonder if it's the other way around where it was named Echo Lake first and then the, coincidentally that happened and it just sort of made it very, you know, fitting of a name. I'm, it's, I'd be interested. I'm, I might have to do more research into why this was called Echo Lake because that's a funny story. Anyway, your question. With the announcing of the director for Star Wars Episode Eight, Rain Johnson, do you think Disney may be uh, overcommitting to fast production? I understand striking while the hammer is hot, but with Harrison Ford injuring himself on the set, is it really realistic? And a follow-up, would you want to see Star Wars Land or Tron Coaster more? Oof. <laughs> to tempt the deal, the Tron Coaster would exit to a full arcade, all Tron themed, uh, obviously the Tron Coaster. You sold me on that. Flynn's Arcade, forget the attraction. You know how much I would love for there to be a Flynn's Arcade in New York City? They'd never do it because, like, you know, I'm uh, once you're of drinking age, the concept of a barcade is amazing. A place where you go with your friends and just get a drink and play arcade games really cheap. If And, like, listen to awesome 80s music. That would be so amazing. And they'll probably never do it, but I wish for it every time I'm going out with my friends. But anyway, to, to your main question, um, do I think they're overcommitting? I mean... 
we it's it's too early to tell, right? We're going to have to see how the movie comes out. If the movie's great, then, you know, they have the talent to pull it off. I don't think them uh, signing Rain Johnson, who's, I think, a great director, by the way, and also, I, I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute, but uh, I think signing him this early is, if anything, it's a good thing, you know? Now they've got that taken care of. <clears throat> and so they can focus more on putting together a good story and making it happen. And I think they've already got the date set. So I feel like at that point, do I hear water? Is it, what is all this water sound? What's going on? That's weird. Um, I, I think they're just thinking ahead and I think that's smart. And I worry about what they're going to do with things like um, Harrison Ford being injured. My suspicion is that they did a whole lot of late night restructuring of their schedule. And, you know, they're not going to lose much time over him being injured. But who knows? Uh, but I, again, I think it always boils down to the final product. Like I was mentioning earlier, all these things have to fire off at the right time. There are a lot of instances of films that were pushed for time, pushed for resources, and they ended up being amazing films for that reason. Look at Star Wars. Star Wars was delayed. It was over budget. The studio didn't really like it. They thought it'd be a dumb kids movie. And it ended up being amazing. All right, so our next question comes from Mr. Static Blitz, who asks, Disney has been known to turn popular Disney animated films into Broadway musicals. But if Disney played their cards right, do you think they could do the opposite and turn a Broadway musical into a movie? I would love to see Touchstone slash Disney do a film adaptation of the Book of Mormon. <laughs> That'd be cool. Uh, the new uh, Adina Menzel play, If Then, and Wicked, as long as they did it with the original cast, music producers, and directors. It's also cool, too, because the cast of Frozen do have backgrounds working in Broadway, such as Robert Lopez, Josh Gad. Um, yeah, like, they... First off, I think absolutely. I think that's totally possible. Um, didn't Rent become a movie? So, like, that's a thing that's happened. Um, and it's done well. So it really is just a matter of them looking for a story that they want and making it work. Uh, and to that extent, the 90s renaissance, you know, you have um, the, the musicians behind it, like Alan Menken, they had a failed history on Broadway, which is kind of funny. They, they tried to do... Broadway, they didn't really pan out for them, so they ended up going out west, and then they ended up making these um, animations that were so classic, music for these animations, that they ended up then becoming Broadway plays, which is sort of a twisted um, and yet fitting fate for them, right? Uh, it really just depends, yeah, I do think they could do it, uh, I wonder if Disney would do it in the meantime, because th they might be spending a lot when it comes to Marvel and Star Wars. But I could see, like, Touchstone doing, like, Wicked, I think, is a big popular one. Um, or if it's under Touchstone, definitely I could see the Book of Mormon. Uh, although, I mean, with um, Trey and Matt Parker being just such media moguls at this point with their shows and uh, the movies they've done, I don't know if they they might be able to do it under Comedy Central, somewhere under Viacom. But, well, you know, I think the point stands. Yeah, it's absolutely possible. <clears throat> Our next question comes from TJ Neon, who asks, uh, I heard that Disney approached J.K. Rowling about Harry Potter land, and she turned them down because she wouldn't give them 100% control. That's when Universal lapped it up. My question, do you think Disney would have done a better job producing Wizarding World than Universal? Do you think it's a good idea putting non-Disney themes, a.k.a. Avatar, in the parks? Great, great question. Um because it, it questions Disney's ability, and that's a tough one to answer. I think they would do a fantastic job. Better than Universal's, I can't say, because I've never been to Universal's, so I don't want to try and judge it without having experienced it. But I would have full faith that they'd pull it off and do it well. I'm not sure exactly where they would do it. I guess somewhere here in Hollywood Studios would probably make the most sense. Um, and I'm not sure what they would do ride-wise. I could definitely see that story being true in that... Um, JK was not cool with giving Disney creative control because Disney, they like creative control. And, you know, I'm sure she does too. Those are her books. Those are her babies. She worked on them for so long. Um, so I can see that being sort of a conflict that would 
break that up. Uh, in fact, it makes me wonder, because James Cameron also seems to be very possessive of Avatar, so I'm wondering how the detailing of the Avatar land or Pandora is going to turn out. And that'll be interesting, and unfortunately we probably won't know until long after it's open. Aha, we have a follower. Um, um, to your other question, where did I put your question? Oh, do I think it's a good idea putting non-Disney themes in uh, the parks? Yeah, I think it's fine. And it's something we've done for decades now. Think about it. Uh, Star Wars, before we owned Star Wars, was there. Um, Indiana Jones, MGM's Hollywood Studio was a joint venture with MGM, which we didn't, like, Disney didn't own. I say we as if I'm the Disney company. So I think that's totally fine, as long as it's treated the right way and sort of um, given the attention it deserves, then I'm totally okay with it. Our next question comes from David Willis, who asks, Howdy, Rob. Do you think Disney would ever consider integrating augmented reality items into the parks? And some examples that he gives is the idea of using it for tours. You could walk through with your own virtual guide, have different guides that give you information while you're on the queues. Um, that's a great question. If you don't know what augmented reality is, the idea is that it's essentially placing digital elements over the real world, thus augmented reality. And the example you'll see that with in, is most like video games right now, but I think it's going to blow up and become something really big soon, especially with Google Glass. And the idea is you take a video feed or a picture feed from the real world and you put elements on it. Think of a lot of Kinect games or... Um, you know, things like on the PlayStation camera, stuff like that, where you see yourself and you're interacting with something that's not really there. I think they could put that stuff in there. I don't know if they're going to do it anytime soon. I think Disney, as um, forward as they look when it comes to technology with rides, I think when it comes to park integration, they try to, they're very much like Apple in that they'll wait to see what shakes out as a sort of standard before they actually implement it. Look at RFID uh, tags. Those have been around for a while now, but they're only really just getting onto this My Magic Band stuff because <clears throat> they probably wanted to see if it was gonna last or not. So, um, do I think they could put that stuff in there? Yeah, I think those ideas are great. The idea of tours, information, um, character stuff. You could do stuff for fun, too. Uh, it's just a matter of seeing uh, how long it takes before augmented reality becomes a normal technology that we use every day. And hopefully that's sometime soon. At least that's what I hope. I love new technology. Okay, as we're parkouring on the hat here, let's pull up the next question. All right. T Believe 44 asks, Rob was Walt a mean boss, and what was Walt's favorite attraction in Disney World and Disneyland? Um, well, unfortunately, he doesn't have a favorite attraction in Disney World. He passed away before they even broke down, broke ground on Disney World, so he didn't get to see it completed. Nevertheless, was able to, you know, find himself with a favorite attraction. Disneyland, I'm not actually sure if he's ever um, committed to a favorite, so I'm, I'm not. Sh I wouldn't know. Uh, I mean, I feel like just from what I've read of Walt, he seems like the kind of person who whatever the latest project was, was his favorite project because he was always putting his all into it. And so, you know, every new project was a new learning experience using new things, new ideas. And so I could see that being, you know, his favorite at the time. <clears throat> to your first question, was he a mean boss? Uh, from what I've read, I don't think he was. I think... He was definitely cranky, and for the reason the reason he was known to be cranky is because when he was younger, he got into a uh, polo accident. He was a big fan of polo. That's the game where you ride the horse and you have the big mallets and you hit the ball around. And he hurt his back pretty badly, and rather than getting surgery that he needed, he pretty much just saw a chiropractor, and what happened was his like vertebrae or his bones in his back fused the wrong way, and so it was a constant source of pain for him. And as a result, you know, if, as you can imagine, living decades with pain on a constant basis uh, could turn you into crank a little bit. So he's been known to be cranky sometimes. He's also been known to be very um, uh, with not withholding, but uh, withdrawn when it comes to praise. You know, uh, he would say when something needed to be changed or when something wasn't good. But, you know. The biggest compliment a lot of Imagineers got when something was great was like nothing at all. It was just, that'll work. You know, that would be like the best thing you get. He would just nod and be like, that'll work. Uh, so in that sense, you know, there wasn't a lot of 
patting on the batter back or anything there. Uh, but I don't think he was ever necessarily mean. I'm sure he had his mean moments. Every boss is going to. That just comes with running a company, and he certainly ran a big one. And finally, here at Epcot, we're going to do uh, what I would like to call the lightning round. These are questions that I think are shorter. I've got shorter answers for, but I still wanted to get to. So let's just jump right in. Max Ray asks, what is your favorite Jungle Cruise joke? Uh, that would be the cue, the joke on the cue at the very beginning when he goes, if you're worried about... Um, if you're worried about converting your money, don't worry. There are banks all along the rivers. I just love Jungle Cruise puns. They're funny. Uh, Gyosht, Ghost. I can't pronounce your name. I keep forgetting. There's an X in it. It throws me off. Um, I was wondering what you think the most impressive place is in MC Magic. Mine is the Disney Dream because I have tried to make a cruise ship and I failed. Uh, mine would have to be the Country Bear Jamboree and the Hall of Presidents. And the reason for that is because they are probably two of the least uh, popular rides in the Magic Kingdom. Yet MC Magic, dedicated enough as always, went in and they made it and they put in all the little details. And they did so probably realistically knowing that not a lot of people were going to visit it. And I think that's impressive to me because it shows their um, dedication to quality, which is really amazing. Aaron asks, when a person auditions to become a character within Walt Disney World, do they have to memorize every little detail about that character that someone could ask them about? Um, also, when you go to Disney, you look for hidden Mickeys. So I don't own any, own any of the hidden Mickey books. I don't actively seek them out, but I will notice them when I'm there in the parks. Like, it just turns on, like, this subtle, you know, behind subconscious search for them. Um... And as for your first question, I think the answer is yes and no. I don't think they have to study all that to audition. I think what happens, and if somebody's a cast member, they could correct me, is that they'll audition, and then when they get the role, they sort of are given a crash course in the history of that character and all their details and how they sign their name and stuff like that. I think that's all after they get the gig as opposed to before. <clears throat> Uh, Jakey asks, what is your opinion on Fantasia Evolved Music, or whatever it's called, that's been announced at E3? It's only coming out on Xbox One, which I thought was strange. What about you? <clears throat> I don't think it's strange because it's a connect heavy game, and while the PlayStation has sort of that functionality, I would imagine that the developer thought it wouldn't be worth the effort considering the install base on the PlayStation for the camera. I don't know what to think of it. I actually haven't seen a whole lot about it. That's one of the things that I do want to look into more when it comes closer to coming out. Uh, just because I'm a Harmonix fan and they're the people behind uh, the original Guitar Heroes and then Rock Band. and So they, they appreciate music and it'll be interesting to see what it's like. <clears throat> but I just haven't looked into it yet. And then finally, Mark asks, Believe it or not, Elsa is now coming to Hollywood Studios with a few other experiences. What are your feelings about Elsa almost taking over Hollywood Studios? I myself don't mind that because the theme park was very lacking of entertainment. It's nice to see Hollywood Studios getting some more entertainment. I agree. Um, and I don't mind. And as long as it's in addition to what's out there already and not in a replacement, I think that's great. I mean, I've mentioned in a previous episode that there's just so much wait for Frozen. And I understand Disney as a business wants to capitalize on that. Ooh, I'm starving. Uh, just in time. They want to capitalize on that and they want to... Um, use that to drive up attendance but you know 500 minute waits 300 minute waits are ridiculous and so there should be other options so i'm happy with the two okay mickey i'm gonna go feed you i want to thank everybody for sending in questions this week if you have a question feel free to leave it in the comments i might not get to all of them i try my best and i'm hoping to sometime soon do like a frequently answered questions episode because i see a lot of um questions pop up over and over again anyway uh i'm rob plays at twitter if you want to follow me um, and if you like this video, you like this channel, you want to support the channel, the best thing you could do is tell a friend. Maybe they'll enjoy it as well. Mickey here is starving. We're going to get some food here. Maybe we'll go up to the garden grill. Um, have a great weekend, everybody. And I will see you all next time for the next episode of Minecraft Disney Q&A.